Hi everyone, we're back again. Uh, this is Deepal Parekh in a conversation with Dr. Paul Wagner. We are continuing with our uh, topic of an unconventional sketch of a history of educational psychology. Um, Dr. Wagner uh, has served as full-time professor of philosophy and logic with the College of Human Sciences and Humanities and uh, area coordinator for statistics, research and educational psychology with with the College of Education at University of Houston, clearly. Um, he has also served as former Vice President of Association of Philosophers in Education and former Executive Secretary of the Philosophy of Education Society. Once again, Dr. Wagner, thank you for this uh, conversation. We left off uh, in the part one with what is so important about Albert Bandura's notion of role modeling. Okay. Um, actually, Albert Bandura is one of, um, I think, the most important psychologists ever to address things relevant to education. It's interesting to see his background. He was uh, somebody who was familiar with uh, the classics, um, such as Aristotle. A lot of people, when they hear Bandura, the first concept that comes to mind is self-actualization. He did talk about self-actualization. And he did so just the way Aristotle did. Um, for Aristotle, what self-actualization was is that you have a sense of contentment such that you could be alone without being anxious. That's one of the ways that, that I would interpret it. And I think that um, when Bandura uh, talks about uh, self-actualization, he's also talking about the sense of completeness that a person has. Now for education, one of the things that he talks about that is so important is the first job that every child has. The first job that every child has, just like um, many young pups um, in the mammal world, first job is to become an adult. You look at children and they may sit in a car in a hot summer and um, it's not going anywhere, it's in a driveway, uh, but they're sitting there pretending that they're driving. Well, you're nine years old, you're not gonna go anywhere. Why are you doing that? Well, because it's a totem of being an adult. Children routinely role model what they see adults doing. Intuitively, they know their first job in life is to become an adult. And so the adults that they see around them, not just in their homes, um, but that matters, of course, and also in their schools, on television, um, and, uh, and elsewhere, all of those are role models. And the children are constantly picking up on that. If you've ever been around a family, and it's a large family, oftentimes, uh, you'll have a child that's uh, very quiet in a large family, and you wonder, well, what's going on in that child's head? Well, that child is essentially becoming a historian of the family because they're watching everything. And not only do they tend to role model it, but they also notice who else seems to be role modeling what adults that are in the environment. So this idea of role modeling is so terribly important. In education, we can stand in front of a class and tell them wonderful things about science and, and uh, math and reading and writing and critical thinking and so on. But more than anything else, it's what we role model that's going to make a difference in the child's life. Thinking about what we role model is very important because in education, we need to think about what is the purpose of education? You pull too many teachers over and you ask them, so what do you think education is all about? And too many teachers will tell you things like, well, it's about teaching and learning. That doesn't take us very far. You can teach a child how to torture a kitten. But surely that's not a part of education. A child can learn how to torture a kitten. Surely that's not a part of education. So the purpose of education 
has to be much more narrow than all that a student could possibly learn or that a teacher could possibly teach much more narrow. So one of the things that and we talk about teaching critical thinking to children, which I think is very important. No teacher ever was able to teach children critical thinking by simply asking an open-ended question, which all it does is solicit any and every opinion. And they don't do it by having a list in front of them about the characteristics of critical thinking, because you just can't take that and transport it into the mind of the students. What you have to do is be the kind of person who is a critical thinker. That means, at the very least, you're the kind of teacher who is always asking the question, how do you know? You're the kind of teacher who is always asking the question, what do you mean by the term so-and-so? And you're the kind of teacher who asks what I call the tolerance question. The tolerance question is, what is the least amount of evidence you can even imagine? such that if it turned out to be true, you would be willing to change your mind about some conclusion. If you can't imagine such evidence, then you're closed-minded. So when a teacher stands before the class, the class needs to see an adult who is constantly asking of herself as well as her students, how do you know? What do you mean by a term so-and-so? And what's the least amount of evidence I can even imagine? Such that if it turned out to be true, I would be willing to change my mind about what I just told you about. Very important that the students see a teacher of that sort. One other element about um, role modeling that I want to want to share with you and, uh, and, and it comes from uh, all this work that Ben Dora did in talking to us about role modeling. I have a Hall of Fame of teachers in my own mind and I've had a lot of teachers over the years uh, but this is a teacher I had in fifth grade. I was uh, fourth or fifth grade so I was nine or ten years old. Her name was Mrs. Fawner. And in those days, teachers had to wear dresses, they had to wear hose, they typically wore heels to come and teach in. And uh, there was a little girl that sat right in front of me in Mrs. Fawner's class, and um, a very pretty little girl. And one day, I heard this funny noise. Turns out she urinated on herself, sitting in a desk right in front of me. And kids had turned around. Mrs. Fawner went rushing to the little girl's aside and took her down to the nurse, told us all to behave while she was gone. And then she came back and she told us, don't any of you tease her about this ever. Don't even talk about it on the school playground. Because if anybody were to ever tease her or talk about this, because she didn't mean to do what she did, you could destroy her for life. And Mrs. Fawner was so convincing in what she said. Yeah, we thought about it for a long time. But what really sealed the deal, Mrs. Fawner dressed the way I just described. Didn't send somebody to go get a janitor because she's a teacher, she doesn't clean stuff up. She got a bunch of paper towels. She came back. And she is right in front of my desk. And she got down on her hands and knees. And she cleaned up the little girl's urine off the desk and off the floor. That role modeling was fantastic. To give you an idea of how potent it turned out to be in the long run. And High school, I was with a, uh, a fellow that I knew back in that, that uh, fourth grade class. 
and it was dark and we're driving around one night as teenage boys are likely to do. And he asked me, um, uh, this girl turned out to be very pretty. And he asked me, could I ever imagine asking her out? And uh, my response was, well, no, not really. And he said, why is that? I said, we're whispering. We're just the two of us in the car by ourselves. And we had been in the same fourth grade class. But we started whispering when we talked about this. Stuff. And I said, well, because she, you know, she urinated on herself. And he said, yeah, I thought about that too. And he said, have you ever talked to anybody about this? I said, not until now. And again, we're whispering to each other. Mrs. Foner's words to us and confirmed by her getting down on her hands and knees to clean that up. Role modeled for us how important it was to protect the well-being of this little girl. And so we did it. And so even by juniors or seniors in high school, we're still cautious about even relating the story to one another in a car by ourselves late at night. That's the power of role modeling. If you look back in your own life on those adults who did the most for you, whether it be a parent or a teacher, but they did the most for you, they, they helped more than anybody else to develop the character. I have a hunch that you will identify somebody who didn't so much as talk to you a lot about do this and do that, but rather it was somebody who lived a certain way. And you role modeled it. Wow. That you, you shared this story from what grade? Fifth, sixth? What? I think I was in fourth or fifth grade. Wow. Uh, happened. Wow. Yeah, so it's a lot of years ago, but I still remember Mrs. Fonder, and surely by this time she's long gone. All right, my next question for you is, why is Alison uh, Gopnik so important in terms of uh, PHN and culprit thinking today? Well, uh, almost anybody in education today has heard a lot about Piaget and, and um, certainly some about Kohlberg. But the, the Piaget of your generation is probably going to be this lady right here, Alison Gottmik yes. at Berkeley. And uh, she does a great job of recognizing that kids are natural scientists. Uh, they're constantly creating hypotheses to explain the world around them, and then looking to confirm their hypotheses. And they also have the courage to accept this confirmation of their hypotheses, mm. which a lot of people as adults can't accept this confirmation of their hypotheses. But kids, kids can do both. And that's because of the surroundings that they live in they eventually are discouraged from doing that and instead are encouraged to just continue to force their own opinions on others. But naturally, if Gottmik is right, kids naturally put forward hypotheses, look for confirmation, and coming across this confirmation are happy to give up their position, that tolerance question and accept something that seems to be more reasonable. Now, in the case of Kohlberg, one of the things that's also interesting is Kohlberg is talking about those moral hypotheticals or hypotheses that we put together to try to guide our life. And one of the things that I think is um, really important about Kohlberg, and, and most of those who've studied Kohlberg in recent years don't know this about him because he, he died before he wrote about this. Uh, he and I were team teaching at the time, so it's one of the reasons that I knew about this. My, my job uh, when I was with him was primarily to be a friendly critic, because I actually, I don't believe 
that the stage theory of moral development holds up as well as uh, uh, as either Kohlberg or Piaget uh, present them. But there was something really neat about what he, Kohlberg was working on toward the end. He thought at the highest stage, there was like a saint-like stage. And um, candidates for his saint-like stage included people like Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, Jesus Christ, and uh, he mentioned a couple other people, I don't remember who they were. And he said, they're not people that so much tell us how to live, that they don't even tell the people around them how to live. They just live well. And the people around them catch on to how they live. I'm reminded of a story about Mother Teresa where after winning the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, so she picked up a million dollars for that. Here she is in Calcutta. And her hospital wasn't the way a lot of people think it was. It wasn't a hospital for sick people. It was really a hospice. She thought there was something tragic about poor people with no place else to go but the gutter in the streets to die. And so her hospital was to take the people off the streets and bring them into this hospital where they would have a quiet place to spend their last hours or days. In one case, after having already won that million dollars, which she gave away immediately to uh, take care of the poor people of Calcutta and uh, to take care of the hospital. But the story goes, she lived, her bed was a wooden bed on a, uh, a essentially a bag of hay. Uh, her mattress isn't what most of us would call a mattress. An older fellow was brought in who was dying she gave up her bed because there were no other beds left in the hospital. She gave up her bed for this guy. She slept on the floor. Now at the time she was in her 70s and she had a heart condition. And I'm thinking to myself, Mother Teresa, you're an old person who needs help. But that's not the way she looked at the world. And she never moralized to people about you should do this and this is how and why you should do it. She just lived this way. And so the nuns around her and other people that encountered her, everyone seems to be affected by the way she lived in her gentleness and her kindness without any lectures. So again, I'm back to Mother Therese, and Mrs. Foner. The teacher's potency is most vividly illustrated with how the teacher role models character an intellectual disposition, an inclination to be reflective rather than dictatorial, either about information or how to behave. Raw model. It all comes from Bandura, and then we can go through Piaget and, and, and Kohlberg and go follow that Bandura thread to what these folks were talking about. And you'll see that Gopnik is spotting things that take us well beyond both BJ and Colbert, and um, we need to follow that path. We need to role model better, and we need to set the stages aside a bit tentatively. Uh, so moving on to a, a, a different side, but connected. Richard uh, Thaler won a Nobel Prize for studying decision-making in economics, and many economists and mathematicians have won Nobel Prizes for studying game theory. But there's only one psychologist to ever win Nobel Prize. Um, who, can you let us know who it was and what did he win that for? Well, that Nobel Prize winner was a fellow by the name of um, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman and his most recent book, it's right here. And um, Daniel Kahneman did most of the work that he won a Nobel Prize for with a colleague by the name of Amos Tversky. And one of the things that they studied, which I think is really significant in education. They studied thinking. 
Now, I am amazed at how many people I've come across in the, our schools who have never heard of Daniel Kahneman. Now, his book called Slow Thinking and Fast Thinking, which preceded this one, had been on a New York Times bestselling list for over a year. You couldn't walk into a Barnes and Noble anywhere I had been to where you wouldn't see his book featured for months and months. And yet when I would come across people in education and want to talk to them about the work of Kahneman and Tversky on thinking, I can't remember coming across a single practicing teacher who had even heard of the only psychologist who won a Nobel Prize uh, in economics, Daniel Kahneman. And yet his specialty was thinking. The reason I underscore that is because the purpose of education is much better understood when it aims at understanding. Understanding requires thinking. Teaching and learning should be narrowly contrived to be seen as ways of developing understanding. That means better thinking. Not effective recollection. Heck, our cell phones can remember more for us than we'll ever remember from the books that we read. We've got access to loads of information. But we don't have access to this deliberative, incredible ways of using that information to better understand the world that we confront each day. And I think um, Kahneman led the way for us to think better and to focus more on thinking. And that should be central to education these days. The year after him, Richard Thaler, who is uh, also a Nobel Prize winner in econ and economics, the year after um, Kahneman, uh, but Thaler too, his whole focus was on studying thinking behavior when it came to uh, deciding which activities people should pursue, um, how they might engage in trade, uh, to what extent do they make the best decisions when they're consuming something as opposed to an alternative thing that they could have gotten for perhaps the same amount of money or less. He too won the Nobel Prize for his study of particularly consumer thinking. We don't spend nearly as much time on the importance of thinking that we should, given that the purpose of education is understanding. Wow. Um, my next question, uh, why are Matthew Lipman and Garrett Matthews remembered by Susan Engel and others as the founders of the philosophy for children um, today? Well, this is Susan Engel's latest book, Harvard University Press. And Susan Engel is a devotee of um, uh, Gareth Matthews and, of course, Matthew Lippman. Matthew Lippman, back in the 70s, started thinking to himself, well, what discipline really specializes in thinking? And, of course, it's philosophy. And so he started doing work on what he was calling philosophy for children. And he developed a lot of disciples over the years. And um, I can remember beginning working with him myself way back in I think it was 78 or 79, and, and ever since then, um, have very close ties uh, to, to Lippmann. Gareth Matthews in the um, middle to late 80s became uh, uh, affiliated with Lippmann. Uh, Gareth Matthews was at University of Massachusetts at Amherst at the time. And Gareth Matthews started looking for ways of bringing junior high and elementary school children into philosophical discussions as a way of developing their thinking. Now, philosophy for children is still, um, its presence is still evident in many parts of the world, including the, the United States. It's not the exact model that Lippmann began with, but it, all of it 
can trace its intellectual heritage back to uh, Lippmann at first and then Gareth Matthews. Susan Engel, uh, a young upcoming professor today, um, teaching critical thinking, but as you read through the book, she attributes much of her understanding of what it takes to develop critical thinking in children to work that she had seen Gareth Matthews do. And Gary, of course, had learned his work from Matthew Lippman. Philosophy for Children today is still about thinking and the kind of stuff that Lippman alerted us to and saying, look, the purpose of education to be about developing skills, careful thinking, the skills of careful thinking together with dispositions to use those skills to figure out the world around us rather than just be so accepting of the messages we get from billboards and television and peer groups and so on um, is invaluable it comes close to revealing the heart of educational purpose. There's a fellow by the name of Philip Jackson, Dean of Education at the University of Chicago, wrote a book about 10 years ago called What is Education? He too is giving the same message I just shared with you. And that message is that education has to be narrowly conceived, not broadly conceived, narrowly conceived as focused on, on understanding. Understanding is the product, critical thinking, and dispositions to use critical thinking to arrive at plausible conclusions. Wow, going back to psychology, um, can you explain what is the concept of flow, F-L-O-W, all about uh, the, the positive psychologists? The positive psychologists are among the um, most exciting area of psychology at work today. Uh, in fact, Martin Seligman, when he was uh, president of the APA, catapulted the, the interest uh, of everybody in positive psychology forward by, by strides. But the fellow that kind of started the whole thing off is a guy by the name of Mahali, Chicks Mahali. That's the best I could do in pronouncing it. Um, uh, his friends called him Mike when he was at the University of Chicago. Mike studied optimal experience. Most listeners will understand what I'm about to share with you as coming under the title in sports as being in the zone. And that, that phrase about being in the zone actually comes from uh, the study of the of positive psychologists of, of achievements uh, of achievements in um, in sports. Now, um, flow is normally described with eight elements. For time's sake, I'm going to describe them just in terms of four elements, in part because the four elements I think. Uh, capture all eight when we when we talk about them. One of the things that the positive psychologists say is that to be happy, to be deeply happy, and they don't think we understand happiness very well in our world today. We think of happiness as chuckles, but they're talking about deep contentment. It's good that I'm here. I'm happy to be me. That's the type of happiness that they're going for. Anyway, so one of the uh, things that they're saying, and I, I think this is a great criteria for how you should strategize your teaching and how you should also um, design your curriculums. All four elements should be evident. Number one, challenge. If Mike is right, then people cannot be happy, not truly, without a challenge. There was an old television show a long time ago called Twilight Zone. And they had an episode where a bad guy gets shot and he dies and um, he struggles his way. He thinks he's still alive into this basement uh, and a butler starts taking care of him. The story ends with the, um, uh, the fellow having lived a 
wonderful life inside this basement. He got everything he wanted. He always got everything he wanted. There was no pleasure he couldn't ask for that he didn't get immediately. He became bored, terribly bored with it. And he said to the butler, maybe I don't belong up here. And the butler chuckles and says, up here? And he said, yeah, up here. Am I not, like, isn't this? And he said, no, sir, it's not. So the message there, you can't be happy without a challenge. The positive psychologists, I think, are onto something very important. You can't be happy without a challenge. In a lot of our classrooms today, we try to bribe the kids into chuckles and giggles and we're having a good time. But that's not leading them to be happy. No contentment, nothing deep. The second element um, of um, uh, flow is there have to be standards of excellence. I'm gonna go back to my friend Aristotle again. Aristotle said, uh, self-actualization, remember we talked about self-actualization with Pandora, it came from Aristotle. Self-actualization for Aristotle said, it's learning and the way this translates is wonderful. He said, self-actualization is learning to exercise your excellencies excellently. There's no room for good enough. We have a lot of students today that they enter classes and one of the first questions they always want to ask the teachers is what's good enough for this or that grade they want to get. And Aristotle's point is good enough will never make you happy. You have to exercise, and he doesn't even say talents. It translates as excellencies. You have to learn to exercise your excellencies in only one way, excellently. Wow. This also tells you a lot about role modeling because the kids that see a teacher who exercises her excellency excellently are much more likely to understand what it means to exercise your excellency excellently. Good enough is never good enough. And all too often, our grading protocols in schools from K probably to graduate school it's now based on good enough standards. What's good enough to get a C, say on the team? What's good enough to get a B? What's good enough? It's good enough to get an A. Why should it even matter if you're not exercising your excellency excellently? If you got that A, but you weren't exercising your excellencies excellently, you're not destined for happiness as a result of that A. Third element of, um, uh, of flow is that um, uh, you've got to, um, you got to somehow get outside of yourself. If you can't get outside of yourself, then you're, you're, you're trapped, you're, you're, you're confined. You have to get outside of yourself. And I want to say another word about excellency, by the way. Excellency won't be the same for every person. And the positive psychologists acknowledge that. But a good teacher is supposed to be competent enough to be able to work with a child so that the child and the teacher together are able to figure out what counts as an excellency for this child, because that's what this child should be aiming for. And if this child exercises that excellency, it's going to be pretty happy. It's not, you know, one size fits all. Now, the third, actually, the, the third, the third flow element before I get to the fourth is resources. And what he means by resources isn't, you know, having a lot of computers in the classroom. What he means by resources is that the excellencies defined by the teacher in collaboration with the student. are accessible to the very best effort of the student. 
John Stuart Mill, very famous genius of the 19th century, said teachers ought to always be able to take a student beyond their capacity at least, at least once or twice. Because how else are you going to find what your limits are? Now, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. But again, in today's world, I don't think there are many students being brought anywhere close to the limits of their excellencies. Boy, what have I really got to offer? Television shows like Alone or Naked and Afraid where people are challenging the elements to do something they didn't think they could do. That pass. They're so happy if they're able to succeed. If you take somebody beyond their level of resources, as you are challenged more and more, your skills and your production increases very nice and slowly and steadily. When you go past the pinnacle of your resources, the drop off on the other side is precipitous. So you don't want to take the child or anybody beyond that because there's no recovering from that. You're, you're just going to crash. Now the fourth element. And the fourth element may be the biggest and most important of all. The fourth element is getting outside yourself. Self is your enemy. The more you think of self, the less your chances of being happy. In our country today, roughly 20% of Americans will suffer a panic attack somewhere in their lifetime. Roughly 5 to 7% will suffer chronic panic. Now, when you're suffering a panic attack or general anxiety, you're not a bad person, but your world has shrunk. And the fear is said to be tremendous. The fear of a panic attack is, is more uh, heartless than even seeing a, chi a tiger charging toward you. People in the midst of a panic attack think they're having a heart attack, right? They may go crazy in front of everybody. It's a horrible thing. What causes that? Well, there may be, you know, uh, biochemical things in there playing a role. But on the surface, we can at least say this seems to be present. And that is that the world has shrunk. And it's just full of self. These people tend not to be selfish people. In fact, they tend, statistically speaking, to be unselfish people. But during a panic attack, the world has shrunk. And there's just self in it. And self is going to die, or it's going to go crazy. Panic attack. And there's been uh, a number of interesting studies, uh, some of the most interesting ones have been anecdotal, um, where somebody is able to break free of a panic attack just by having the opportunity to focus on something else. You can't just tell them to focus on something else. But if something happens to draw their attention to something else, before you know it, they're out of a panic attack. I had a friend one time who was a uh, surgeon, and he was having panic attacks. And um, he went to his uh, psychiatrist, um, which that was a big step alone for him. He didn't have a lot of faith in psychiatrists. Went to a psychiatrist, psychiatrist told him hmm, there was a panic attack coming on down to a thousand. And um, my friend had told me that there have been days where he counted to a thousand, probably a thousand times that day. Because the panic attacks kept on ripping into him. And when he uh, returned visit to the um, psychiatrist, he said, should I stop doing surgery? Because what happens if I have a panic attack during surgery? And the psychiatrist told him, no, don't stop doing surgery. Uh, because, I mean, how else are you going to pay me? That was a little joke. Uh, the surgeon did say, or the psychiatrist did tell him, don't stop doing surgery. But his reason was, he said, you've never had a panic attack in surgery, have you? And he said, well, no. And he said, but sometimes I've gotten anxious scrubbing up to go into surgery. And he said, yeah, what happens if you go through the doors? He said, well, the person's anesthetized and I've got to do the job. And the psychiatrist said, that's exactly right. 
surgery is so all-consuming. There is no room for self. And so as a lifetime surgeon, you know, you walk through the doors and there isn't an exercise patient, you got to go to work. Now, you may have a panic attack after surgery, but you won't have it during the surgery. Get outside of yourself. So focus on self can be destructive. Happiness, your well-being, and if you're doing your job well. Teachers who are frightened of standing in front of a class, and well, what if I have a panic attack in front of the class? The way out? is not to worry about that, but to stay focused on what am I going to do next? Not just to help the entire class, but start looking at some of these individual kids because there are kids who one day will be focused, will be separate and panic themselves one day. Aren't you, don't you feel empathetic for them? They need a role model who can show them again and again, I can make life better by focusing my attention on figuring something out. Now, let's look at the flip, flip side. Uh, how happy do we get by getting outside of ourselves? And um, uh, I have a, an example from my own life that happiest moment of my life. I had a son who had a uh, girlfriend and they, um, when they were in college, the first time that they encountered each other romantically was at a place I had owned out, out in the country. Now this girl was very shy and her family was very wealthy. My son wanted to get her something special for Christmas. And he asked me, what should he get her? And so I suggested, I was having an artist come out and paint different scenes in my place. And the people who were going to be getting these paintings would not be at the ranch for Christmas. So she would be the only one if I had the artist paint one for her she would be the only one that would get that. And since from what you told me about um, the two of you and in, in, in this place, uh, that might be a very sentimental gift to get for. And my son told me, oh, dad, that's your generation, not mine. I did ask him if you ever saw uh, a movie called uh, Clint Eastwood's movie about Bridge over Madison County. Uh, he was unplussed by that, but oh well. So on Christmas Eve, they showed up uh, he and his girlfriend showed up at the uh, uh, at the ranch. It was about 11 o'clock at night, so we all said, yeah, how do you do? And we all go to bed. The next morning, we get up, and, uh, oh, he had mentioned about getting her some running shoes. Uh, she had admired them at the mall one time. But she had a huge car, and she had a car phone. This was back in the days when few people had car phones, and no one had cell phones yet. Um, but she just said her, her parents would take them to Durango to go skiing in her private jet. She didn't need a pair of running shoes, but I said, so well, she admired those in the mall one time. Now yeah, he went ahead and got her running shoes. Middle of the night when they were uh, out of our place um, on Christmas Eve, I got up, I went out and I found the box that had her name to her from my son. And I took the card off and I forged his signature on it and to her and so I put it on that, that box of shoes. And then I did have the painting made. And so I had the card with his original writing on that painting and all wrapped up and behind the tree. Well, the next day it became time to give out presents and we give out presents in a very civilized way. The youngest person there will pick up a gift that's under the tree, give it to whoever it's addressed to and we all wait till that person opens it and then we all act like it's wonderful. And then the youngest goes and gets another present and go on that way. Toward the end of the morning, uh, well, um, midway through the morning, the oldest, oldest brother is in a panic. You know, he wants to have his girlfriend get the, the shoes. And so the youngest son goes to where he's directed, brings it over, gives it to her, and she acts like, oh, that's so nice. Toward the end of the morning, um, youngest son goes behind a tree and he sees something that looks pretty big. So he pulls it out and goes, oh, well, it's two. You this girl. You know, my son, the oldest son, shoots me a look that, you know, dad, you stupid, you know, I could kill you. I can't believe you did that. And uh, so you got to pretend for a moment that you're me that day. This girl was very shy. 
opens up the gift. She's sitting on a stool in the middle of the living room. She opens up the gift to the painting. She doesn't move. I mean, it seems like minutes are going by and she doesn't move. And everyone's just kind of watching because nobody else knew what went on except for me. And um, finally she stands up, tears all over her face. And she goes to hug him. Remember, you're me now in that living room and I'm my oldest son. And, and she goes to hug him. And he sees me and goes from then, very stupid, to going, The best, probably the best moment of my life, certainly my best Christmas. Nobody could have given me a Rolls Royce or a Bentley or anything that I'll do that. Here I was able to hit a home run for somebody I cared about very much, my own son. Positive psychologists tell you, you want to be happy? Get outside yourself. You want to be unhappy? Fall inside yourself. So what's the message for teaching? You go in there and you teach and you stay focused on each kid, the day will go well. You go in there and you worry about what they're thinking of you or how things are going, the day's going to be a long time. Probably everyone watching has had some kind of boring job uh, when they were going through high school or whatever. And you look at the clock and it's, you get off at 3 o'clock and it's 7 minutes to 3. Oh, man, this day has taken forever. You look at the clock again, it must be 10 minutes later. No, it's still seven minutes to three. Oh, geez. And see, so wait, and you wait, and wait. You look at the clock again. It's still seven minutes to three. This is a miracle. How, that's, how is that happening? It, more than a minute's got to have gone by. It's just so boring. Everything, nothing's going on. Blah, blah, blah. What time is it? Oh, it's six minutes to three. You know, we've had that experience. We've also had the experience where this job that we had, just some kind of ordinary job working at McDonald's or whatever. Time went by like that. I was busy all day. And all of a sudden you look up and it's three minutes to three. And you go, I can't believe it. I'm off work in three minutes. Where did all that time go? You got outside yourself because you had to, you were kept busy the whole time. Teachers, you want to succeed and you want to really thrive and enjoy your work. Get outside yourself. Your commitment is to helping each of them understand. Your commitment isn't all about teaching and learning. It's about helping them understand a much more narrow sort of thing. That's the focus. Every minute. Every, every minute. Not like in the first 10 minutes of each class. No. Every minute. And the more that you allow yourself to be focused on yourself, the more if you're vulnerable to panic attacks or anxiety, the more you're at risk to suffering one. Is it really worth it? And do a much better job if you focus on your teaching. Okay, next. You know, the, what, what you just said, um, that could be really applied to like me who's in this doctoral program, uh, I can really use some of those tips to move along. Oh, Thank good. you. Um, <clears throat> so the next question, it's more general, like what is the most important question for educators uh, to ask according to evolutionary psychology? Now, short answer to this one, but it's also very profound. Um, Remember, evolution is all about things have changed over a time to adapt to changing circumstances. But one of the aces in the hole that um, all mammals were given um, was uh, all mammals have capacity to learn. Even fish seem to have a number sense. Holy smokes. The capacity to learn seems to be instinctual. The desire to want to learn is instinctual. If it wasn't, this species would have disappeared a long time ago. 
So the evolutionary psychologist looks around at our schools today and, 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 and then they hear about this guy called Horace Mann over Massachusetts 300 years ago, started the first public school. And they had truancy laws. The truancy laws were to make parents let their kids come to school. Because the kids wanted to come to school. Parents wanted them to stay on the farm and work and all that. Today, today we have truancy laws still. But those truancy laws are forced the kids to come to school. What's happened? Evolution already took care of things for us. When you have people running around going, well, how do we motivate the kids to want to go to school? The evolutionary psychologist would say, wrong question. Evolution took care of that question. You need to be asking, what on earth are we doing today to destroy the natural instinct evolution already gave us to be learning animals? Wow, that's that's deep. Um, so for <clears throat> what has neuropsychology uh, got to offer educators, especially in math, um, as you write your your uh, as you write about it in your book, the personality of mathematics. Right. Well, one of the things that we know in neuro from neuroscience is that lots of animals, as I mentioned, even fish have a, a number sense. Um, a cheetah running down a willow beast has to make a decision, a number sense decision about how long should I pursue the chase because they're using up calories to get calories, right? If I get the willow beast, you know, I, I restore the calories I've lost. If I chase and chase and chase the willow beast, but I don't catch him, I've lost all these calories and now I'm even less well equipped to chase the next willow beast. So the cheetah, or jaguars, whatever, they seem to have a natural ability, a number sense is what the psychologists call it, not number processing, but a number sense. Uh, they have a number sense to know when I'm making a bad bet right now, if I keep on pursuing this particular willow beast on this hot day and uh, it turned out this little beast was faster than I thought he was gonna be. And I should discontinue the chase and wait for an easier target. Or you may decide, I, I think I can get this one just another 30, 40 yards. I think I'm gonna pull him down. Uh, that, that number sense determines what the cheetah or the jaguar will do. Humans, even primitive tribes that we look at today, we have number vehicles for keeping track of processing groups of things besides that natural number sense, that we, which we have too. But we also have a number processing capacity. Uh, and in the case of mathematical geniuses like Stephen Hawking and Einstein and Sophie Germain and, and Sofia Kovalevsky and Emmy Noether, um, where these people consider things that are phenomenally deep and abstract um, because we have this enriched language that includes mathematics, um, they all have a number sense too. Uh, so what is there about this? And where did it come from, this special number processing ability? And there's something about the realm of mathematics that should tantalize every student to want to spend more time in school and in studying math as much as anything else, think of, I'm going to give you just one example. There's a gazillion of them I could spend all the rest of the night talking about. Think of infinity. Everyone can say, oh yeah, I know what infinity is. It means you can always add one more. Yeah, that works. That works. So on a set of natural numbers, you can always add one more. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that, that would make the set infinite. What about the set of odd natural numbers? Is the set of odd natural numbers infinite? Well, yeah, you can always add two more. Okay. Well, is the set of odd natural numbers and the set of natural numbers the same size? 
or not? They, they're both infinite, right? Yeah. So are they the same size or not? I don't know, man. I mean, if you draw the number line and you put the natural numbers up on the top, one, two, three, four, five, six, going on to infinity. And below you put the odd natural numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine, on to infinity. That's set on the bottom. The whole set can fit inside the set on top. So the set on top seems to be bigger. It can envelop the lower set. But you said they're both the same. They're both infinite. You're, are you trying to confuse me? That's part of the nature of math. Gene, so and one of the things that one of the things that we do with mathematics is that, and that we do with set theory, the two infinite sizes are equal in size. But the set of odd natural numbers does in fact fit inside the set of natural numbers. So by using set theoretic talk, we're able to accommodate what appeared to be an impending paradox that we're going to have to wrestle with. Now, that stuff is just so cool. And in mathematics, you have lots of things like that that creep up. Uh, like I said, I could give you an example. In India, they spent 500 years arguing about whether or not zero should count as a number. And when they finally got to that point and shared it with the folks in the Mideast, the people in the Mideast got all excited about it. And then when Leonardo of Pisa, um, down in the Mideast, studying algebra with a fellow whose name was Algebra, that's where we got the name algebra from. When Leonardo of Pisa came back to uh, Italy and told folks in Italy about algebra and told them about what the folks in India had done in figuring out that zero should count as a number, and here's why. It became the beginning of what historically we recklessly have called the Italian Renaissance. But the Italian Renaissance was just a continuation of what was go had been going on over in India and then in the Middle East and then had gotten into Italy. Mathematics is just cool as can be if you let people think about its paradoxes and potential paradoxes. Wow, we can actually have a whole video on just just the math portion. <laughs> um, so, just keep um, moving along with your about your next book. What is the key concept to remember from from one of your books uh, titled "Thinking Beyond the Test"? Well, the key uh, concept in the uh, book "Thinking Beyond the Test" is is uh, basically that the the focus of education has to be on human development. And the thing that separates us from all the other species is our capacity to understand. So we shouldn't be training humans the way we train our dogs and dolphins and other sorts of animals to behave upon command to perform some kind of trick that they recollect. The whole goal should be focused on figuring things out and on figuring things out that matter matter a lot. You can teach anything. You can learn all sorts of things. But in education, those things that you teach and learn should be of great intellectual challenge, should be of great social import, should involve things like character, um, should po push us to the limits of our ability to figure things out. No other animal ever came up with a computer. We have, and we keep on trying to figure out how we can push our computers further and farther to do more and more of what we do, but they can't do it on their own. We're looking at self-driving cars right now. Google, Mercedes, everyone's been looking at uh, coming up with self-driving cars for at least a decade. It's not there yet. Cars, the computers in the cars have a lot of trouble recognizing what we normally recognize. We see it at an intersection. Somebody is driving that other car. We look at our eyes. We go, I think he's going to just run that light and go right through it. And so we hold back. How do you program that anticipation, that intuition into a, uh, a, a computer 
efficiently. Um, we, we've had uh, cars, computerized cars, uh, drive themselves into a ditch rather than hit a plastic bag because I couldn't tell the difference between a plastic bag and some kind of human or animal that had blown run across in front of them. We'll do a lot of work. We're, we will have self-driving cars someday. I don't have any doubt of that. But it's a ways off. And if we have that, that should be an important intellectual achievement that we can show ourselves that we were able to do. And the fact that we're concerned, not just that the car can be made and driven, but that it can protect human uh, pedestrians shows that we think character matters. We don't just go after to make a buck. We want to make sure that we don't hurt people in the making of a buck in making those self-driving cars. Wow. So thinking beyond the test, I just described what we're aiming for. It isn't just preparing people for tests. It isn't just preparing people to recollect things when they're all walking around. Our grade school kids have more memory at their disposal than a dozen 70-year-old PhDs in science in the sciences. So we're focusing on what matters. And that's what thinking beyond the test is about. So similarly, what is the key concept uh, to remember from your book, uh, Focus on Thinking? Well, the book Focus on Thinking uh, is um, uh, an introduction to critical thinking. But the vast majority of the book is full of scripts that somebody who has never had logic, um, has never um, really been, and never been to law school, never been into the kind of circumstances where they had to define and question and follow up one question with another in a very uh, rigorous pattern, how they can lead a discussion with kids. In this case, usually it's um, uh, ele elementary school age kids and junior high kids, but it can be used also for some high school, but junior high is the main target. And so you create um, discussions that are not just open-ended, uh, discussions that don't just have an answer at the end, but discussions that leave people thinking deeply when the discussion is all done. Sometimes the script ends with the very question the script began with. We also use something in there that we call landmines. And a landmine inside of a script, in the book, for example, focus on uh, thinking, a landmine begins with the expert script maker, which is the authors. Um, we've asked a question, and we have every reason to know what the predictable answer is going to be. So we ask the question, and the people listening are going to come up with an answer that they all pretty much agree with. And then we have two types of landmines. The one type is right after they do that, we might ask them, another question that we also know they're going to want to lurch forward and give, oh, well, everyone knows, and they're going to give us that kind of an answer. But then we'll be able to point out to them, well, given what you said in the first case, that contradicts what you said in the second case. I confess confusion. Help me out here. How do you sort between these two? And then they become befuddled. Befuddlement is good. Because befuddlement, like, like the psychologist Leon Festinger used to say, it's cognitive dissonance that awakens us to um, the need for more deep thinking. One of the most quotable lines I have ever written, and so I've written it three or four times so that uh, if other people copy it, I'll get credit for it, is this. Doubt is what rescues us from intellectual complacency. And so those landmines, they should create doubt. Rescue the people in the group 
through intellectual complacency. Second type of landmine, we ask a question, we know what kind of answer we're gonna get. And then we give them not another question, but we give them a statement about, well, then, so, so the world would look like this. So we give them some kind of a, a statement that they would necessarily find um, compatible with what they had just responded to the previous question with. And yet, the more they think about that statement, the more uncomfortable they get with it. We got another landmine blows up in their in their hands as it were, and instead of forced them to want to think about more questions. And the rest of the script is carefully configured so that subsequent questions continue to buy and open that. Subsequent questions are all about asking, creating doubt and liberating the discussants from intellectual complacency. And for whatever it's worth, a little aside, every one of the scripts in all of my books, I was the sole author of, I've been writing those scripts going way back when I was working with Matthew Littman back in the late 1970s. Um, so in the same context, what is the key concept to remember from your book that we recently did a video on thinking ahead? Thinking ahead is really to push, push forward. It's the, um, uh, more advanced book um, because the attention to matters of formal decision theory is beyond what anyone's ever really going to need to teach um, uh, anything in K through probably K through 12. If you're going to use some of that stuff on formal decision theory in high school, it'd be with an honors group. Um, the, the purpose is to get uh, uh, school administrators and some of your better teachers to look at elements of more systematic decision theory that they can choose from, both to do better planning of all sorts in, in the, um, the institution side of the schools, but also to take advantages of um, offering students an opportunity to see that decision-making can be more formalized. I'll give you one example. And there's, a, I, I did this in an article in the, the Journal of Sex Education. And uh, uh, I was talking about high school students and, and sex education. Students, when they take their first course in sex education, they wanna, they wanna know things like, why does it feel zippy doo dah when you kiss somebody? And, and when you kiss somebody else, it's like kissing your own hand. And of course, none of those questions are going to get answered in sex education classes. Sex education classes are going to be talking about coping machinery, getting nasty diseases, and how much of a hassle it is to have a baby. So when the course is over with, the kids are still like, what the heck happened? I thought I was going to learn something about sex education, and I learned about these three things. And I still don't know what I want to know about sex education. So in this article I did for the Journal of Sex Education, um, one of the things that I mentioned is that the real driving force in high school um, behavior um, with regards to sex it really isn't raging hormones. That's a part of it, but probably a small part of it. More than anything else, it's the quest for popularity. So is there a way that we can teach kids something about decision making, like we do in thinking ahead, and decision making that can help them better evaluate how I might secure popularity over the long run? Or am I going to discount it to get it as quickly as I can right now. But is there a way of thinking about this more rigorously than just shooting from the hip? And so um, uh, I have, I, I take, uh, I create a little game uh, that we do in, in game theory, with nine cells. Uh, and in this, this game, if you ever saw the movie A Beautiful Mind by John Nash, it's one of the founders of game theory. 
And uh, so in this movie, there's a scene where John Nash, a graduate student at Princeton, is with some of his other PhD candidates there in math. And they see several ladies come in and one of them spectacularly good looking. And all the guys want to jump up and go rush her. And uh, Nash tells them all to sit down and settle down a bit. He said, if you all go up and rush her, chances are none of you will wind up with her. The best you could hope for is that one of you wind up with her and all the rest of you are going to wind up with what? Because none of the other girls is going to want to settle for second best. So you're blowing all your shot on a very small likelihood of success. So what to do, what to do. And what Nash works out for them is each one of you pick out a girl that you will approach and nobody else will approach that girl. And then you're all likely to have met a girlfriend for the evening at least, you know, to get to know each other. And so the guys go, well, that's really good. And of course, to keep the guys from fighting with each other, nobody gets to pick, I, and I nicknamed this, uh, the girl in the movie, Beauty, we'll call her Beauty. No one picks Beauty. So all the guys go up to the girls and they all walk away with the girls smiling and happy and the guys are happy and Beauty's there all by herself. Now they don't show this in the movie, but this is the way I would imagine the game, you know, because it's all game theory. Let's imagine John as the master game theorist. He waits till his buddies have all walked off with the girls. Can you imagine how Beauty, who has always been the star of everything, nobody took notice of her at all? And all of her girlfriends walked away from her and they walked away with the guy she's by herself. And then this guy comes up to her and he says, I'm John. And so nested in the smaller game that he taught them may be a bigger game, which he anticipated. And so now everyone has won. In any case, that shows you how game theoretic thinking can help you recognize the social options available to you in the optimally rewarding way. I don't want to take too much longer, so I'm not going to go into it. I have another game in that article uh, where I call, call it the Fonzie Fonzette game. And uh, the girl has to make a decision. She, she's getting pressure by Fonzie. Remember Fonzie from Happy Days. She's getting pressure from Fonzie to go further than she wants to go. And she knows that part of her popularity is being Fonzie's girlfriend. So if she doesn't go further than Fonzie wants her to, is he going to um, leave her? And then what will happen to her popularity if he does? How much does she value her popularity? If she caves into Fonzie, is that any guarantee that she will remain Miss Popularity along with Fonzie for how long? I mean, maybe he'll still leave after a while and, and then she'll be double nobody, perhaps. So how can we arrange a, a cell in which we can see what the value of different quantitative points can be laid out to help us make the best decision in alignment with our desire to be popular today, tomorrow, and through the rest of school. So in the, uh, in the book, Thinking Ahead, I'm doing that kind of thing for actually teachers and administrators and some of that stuff can be played over to um, you know, teaching in, in high school. Um, but um, you know, the example I just gave there actually came out of uh, an article uh, in the Journal of Sex Education. Uh, and, and, and I also, and by the way, in that article, I discourage people from even having classes of sex education. Copulating machinery can be taught in biology classes. Diseases can be taught in biology classes. Sex education ought to be across the entire curriculum. In literature courses, there's plenty of things that talk about sex and popularity. In history classes, there's plenty of things that talk about sex and popularity. John Nash, in my own examples, that's using mathematical game theory to talk about sex and popularity. Um, in biology, 
evolution is often portrayed in terms of game theory. So there's no reason why sex education cannot be responsibly spread throughout the curriculum and made more palpable to students, particularly in a way that they would be used to it. To have a separate class on sex education seems, we don't need a knowledge silo for sex education. The kids are leaving school and driving home down streets that have billboards advertising sex at the same time they're trying to sell a bottle of booze or a car. Um, they turn on TV, even Nickelodeon, little nine and 10 year olds are dating. I mean, their whole world was filled with it. So in school, not to acknowledge that it's just a part of the world and you can use their interest in the topic, popularity, and, and, and sex is really an adjunct to popularity. It's not raging hormones aren't the story. Um, but that can be used as a way of generating an interest and understanding virtually every subject we teach. And courses in sex education have notoriously been discredited by students as boring and uninformative. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> so last, um, you already mentioned um, this little bit earlier uh, about your book of Personality of Mathematics. Yeah. What, what is the key concept to remember from that book, the personality of yeah. mathematics? We think that every subject really has something analogous to a personality, okay? And so there's a reason why some people become, you know, history uh, aficionados. They just love history. And there's something about them and they tend to find each other and they want to talk to each other about history. And they're just elated to get into some new study of history. And there are people in literature who love to see how words can be massaged to create certain pictures and so on. And there are people that in biology, it's like, wow, this physical world was all around us and I never knew that could be broken into these little parts to explain how to think. So each subject seems to have its own personality and that shouldn't surprise us because we see the kids that tend to gravitate to one subject rather than another have a certain taste for it. Um, and, and so the same is true of mathematics. That, that example I gave you a little while ago about, about infinities and so on. I mean, there are just some kids that are overwhelmed with that type of thinking going, oh, that's the greatest thing I ever heard. I, you know, how do you figure that out? Um, and uh, so that's really what that, that one's about. I'll give you one, one quick example that we talk about in that, in that book. There's something in mathematics, again, it fits with um, infinity called Hilbert's Hotel. But it's called that because the famous mathematician David Hilbert came up with it. He said, you got a hotel, it has an infinite number of rooms. Okay. And it's filled. Okay. Now, what are you going to do when a new guest comes along and says, I'd like a room? Can they have a room or not? It's an infinite hotel. But it's filled, infinite number of guests. Is there a solution? Yeah, there's a real easy solution. And Hilbert tells us about it. You just have the, um, the bellhop go to the first room, tell the people in the first room you're going to have to move, you got to move into the second room. Then he goes to the bellhop and uh, goes to the second room, says, You guys are going to have to move. You're going to have to move to the third room. And they just do that all the way down the line. And why can't they keep on doing it? Well, because there's no end to the rooms. So they all keep on moving. And, you take that guest and you just put them into the first room. And if you understand that, then you can understand that there can also be another guest, a second guest that comes up. And if you understand that the second guest can come up, then you can understand, as Hilbert pointed out, there can be an infinite number of new guests showing up. It's just cool stuff. It, it sounds so simple, but yeah, it, you can have infinite number. Yeah. Well, as always, thank you so much for, for the enlightening uh, enlightenment and, and sharing the, the wealth of knowledge you have on all these different um, disciplines. Thank you so much. It all connects uh, to, to one and to what we see every day. It's very uh, applicable to anything you can uh, talk about, any topic. So thank you so much. 
for these valuable lessons outside of the classroom, which are really valuable in, in sense of day-to-day uh, -day life and, and inside or outside of, of the school environment. I, I, I'm sure yeah. the, the viewers and, and readers of your books very much appreciate this stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this time with me as well. Bye-bye, Deval. Bye-bye.